This lecture uh, is in preparation for um, the discussion of uh, uh, the online discussion of Livy, um, the text known as Ob Orbe Condita. Um, and so uh, this will provide a little background on Livy, uh, on his context, his historical context, and on uh, some of the things that appear in that text so the students can uh, try to make sense of it. First of all, Livy was a Roman historian. Uh, you see on the slide here a, an image um, of him. Uh, famous Romans often had statues, uh, commissioned statues of themselves, or, or someone else uh, had one made um, about, about famous people. Uh, Livy did have that kind of stature. Uh, his dates were 64 BCE through 17 CE. And this was a pivotal period in Roman history. Livy was a traditionalist. Um, the uh, Roman Republic, which had existed from about 500 BCE uh, until the end of the first century BCE, was uh, very much on Livy's mind um, as he wrote his history. Um, the, uh, Livy was born in the midst of a kind of crisis of the Republic, um, a time when men of personal ambition uh, sort of grew larger than the system uh, of politics that existed in Rome at the time. Rome had conquered a very large territory, and uh, uh, this allowed men of, of ambition to put together armies uh, which served them rather than the Republic. Um, this led to a series of civil wars, um, most famously between Pompey the Great and Julius Caesar, um, as portrayed in the HBO miniseries uh, called Rome. Um, and uh, Julius Caesar emerged victorious in that uh, civil war. But um, uh, Caesar then, of course, was assassinated, and his uh, nephew, um, Augustus Caesar, or Octavian as he was known previously, then became uh, the ruler of Rome after also fighting a civil war against his former ally Marcus Antonius, or Mark Antony. Um, and so, you know, Livy grew up during this time of crisis. For about the first 30-plus uh, years of his life, Rome was in a constant state of, um, of conflict. Um, it was only with the victory of Augustus Caesar over Antony that uh, Rome settled down a bit. Augustus created a political system with, with himself on the top, though he did this carefully to make it appear like he was sharing power. Augustus was a pretty shrewd political operator. Livy, as a perceptive historian, though, understood what Augustus had done and was not entirely happy with it. And some of his historical writing uh, contains criticism of the system that Augustus set up. He may have accepted it and even perhaps acknowledged that it was necessary, um, but uh, he, wasn't, he missed the old republic and, and kind of longed for those days. And so, as some historians had done before him, he took a very long view of history. Now, Livy wrote in the tradition of other historians of the ancient world, um, particularly the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides. Herodotus, the great historian of the Persian War of the early 5th century BCE, and Thucydides, the historian of the Peloponnesian War of the end of the 5th century BCE. And Herodotus and Thucydides, among other things, uh, contributed to the kind of general Western sense of history. That is, that history teaches lessons that ought to be learned by students of history. Um, uh, also, that history ought to be recorded accurately, that, there was, uh, that the burden was on the historian to get the history right to some extent. But they were concerned in particular about uh, history as moral uh, lesson. Um, that one could look back at history and learn what to do and what not to do. Um, and uh, to some extent, Livy uh, wrote in this vein, but, but for Livy, history was also heritage. History, um, and, and it was, that was true for Thucydides and, Thero and Herodotus to some extent as well. Uh, but Livy wrote about Rome, the history of Rome, because it was an exploration of his heritage, of the kinds of deeds that the great Romans had done and uh, uh, the sorts of things that people in his day could learn from those great deeds, the examples that they could then copy um, in, in forming their own views of uh, politics or culture or, you know, whatever, uh, whatever issue they were encountering. Um, 
Livy wrote on a scale that, or, or in a volume that has been replicated by very few historians. Uh, his most important work, his main work, uh, really the, the, the work into which all of his, uh, he put all of his effort, was known as the Ab Urbe Condita Libri. In Latin, that means the books from the foundation of the city, or from the founding of the city. Um, in other words, his intent was to write a history of Rome from the foundation of the city to the present. Uh, he did this in 142 books, um, or divisions of the work. Um, the vast majority of these, unfortunately, are not extant. Uh, they have been lost to the ravages of time. They have not been preserved in manuscripts over the centuries. And so we have um, only a few dozen of these. I can't remember exactly how many uh, of these. Um, that's something I suppose you could look up on Wikipedia or something like that. The most um, famous part probably is the uh, beginning, the first five books of the Ab Urbe Condita, which trace the history of Rome from the foundation of the city under the legendary figures Romulus and Remus to uh, this key moment at the beginning of the 4th century BCE. So Rome was founded legendarily in the 8th century. The Romans traced their founding date to, the, uh, to April 21st, 753 BCE. Um, that is just a legendary founding date. There was no one around sort of keeping track of the actual date at the time. Um, and for a time, Rome was under the control of, uh, of kings, of outside kings, uh, Etruscans, the people to the north, had uh, uh, conquered a kingdom, and Rome was part of that. Around 500 BCE, Rome, uh, this is all according to legend, though there is some basis um, in archaeology that we can corroborate some of this. Uh, around 500, it seems, Rome managed to break away from the Etruscan kingdom, uh, which itself broke up, and uh, Rome then established its republic. And so this is a key period for Livy, even though he's writing, you know, four or five hundred years after the fact, this early period of Roman history was pivotal for the foundation of Rome, uh, not just politically and uh, geographically, but also for the values in which these, uh, with which these founders in, uh, instilled the city. Right, um, uh, much like Americans look at the founding fathers of uh, of this country as these kind of examples, as wise men who uh, who laid down, they were mostly men um, in Rome as in, you know, the founding fathers of this country, um, uh, who laid down these wise dictates of how to run the country, and these are ensconced in documents. Well, the Romans felt similarly about the, the founding fathers of their city, about the people from their distant past. So this brings us to the text then. Um, the event described in Livy is uh, what is known as the Gallic sack of Rome. The people uh, called the Gauls were part of a larger movement of peoples in the ancient world, uh, peoples we can fit under the rubric Celtic. Um, Celtic peoples uh, roamed sort of far and wide in the ancient world, uh, all the way from the Middle East, uh, from Asia Minor, or what is now Turkey, uh, through most of what is now Europe, um, uh, the most recognizable Celtic places, of course, are, are the British Isles. Ireland and Scotland, you know, have this reputation for being Celtic. But in the ancient world, Celtic peoples were all over the place. They even migrated into Italy, and uh, under uh, the leadership of their warrior chieftains, it seems, threatened Rome uh, at the beginning of the 4th century, and even uh, managed to take the city and burn much of it to the ground. And so we pick up the Livy uh, story with the... Um, uh, decision of the Roman people, or rather the debate among the Roman people, of whether or not they should continue to live in the, on the site of their city, which is now in ruins, or whether they should, in fact, move to another place which already has uh, established buildings and an established infrastructure, whether it's worth the effort. Um, of course, the, the one who takes charge of the conversation here is the Roman general Camillus, and uh, if you were to read back into the story that Livy tells about the Gallic sack of Rome, you would see that Camillus is really the hero of the story, that even though he had been exiled from the city uh, for uh, on charges of embezzlement um, from the government, that he had returned 
uh, to be kind of the savior of Rome, um, and that he had you know, brought about some military reforms that had allowed the Romans to fight off the Gauls um, and to reclaim their land, but unfortunately that land was now, um, um, the, the city itself uh, was much in ruin, right? Um, and so Camillus is the one talking, and there are some ironies to this. Camillus talks about how the Romans should have a commitment to their city, when uh, at the same time he says that he was exiled from the city for a lengthy period, and that during that exile he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't have wanted to go back to Rome, but he still feels this tie to Rome itself. One of the uh, reasons why Camillus, uh, one of the reasons that Camillus gives, I should say, for uh, remaining on the site and taking the effort to rebuild the city is that the gods are present in Rome. Right, that the gods uh, saw to the foundation of the city. Uh, he even goes on to mention some of these ancient Roman gods by name. Um, and uh, so he says, for instance, at the beginning of section 5.52, uh, 5 uh, we possess a city founded upon auguries. No place within its boundaries lacks the presence of the gods. No more days have been established for solemn sacrifices than there are places in our city to perform them. Would you desert all public and private gods? Now for this we have to understand a little bit uh, ancient conceptions of religion. Uh, ancient peoples like the Romans, also the Greeks and, and others, believed that uh, the forces of nature were associated with the gods. and In fact, the presence of the gods could be felt just about everywhere. This is why they worshipped multiple gods, because there were multiple uh, facets or components to nature. You know, there was, I mean, there's water, there's air, there's the weather, there's the land. Um, you know, there are also things like human emotions, like love and jealousy. And uh, each of these forces at work in their world, they saw as being governed by a god. Okay. Now, human beings could discern the will of the gods. Um, he talks about, he uses this word auguries. Uh, the image here is actually of a figure, the one in the center at least, is, is a figure of an augur in ancient Rome. An augur was one who w was reputed to be able to uh, discern the will of the gods through various means. Um, he carried a symbol of his position. You can see this kind of shepherd's crook thing in his right hand. And also you see a bird there at the bottom because one of the ways that the augurs were uh, thought to divine the will of the gods is by observing the patterns, the flight patterns of birds. And so the auguries were an intrinsic part of the city, an intrinsic part of Roman culture. Um, and uh, in Camillus's mind, abandoning Rome meant abandoning their gods, abandoning their duty, and committing um, the, uh, the act of impiety. Romans felt that they owed obligations to their gods, and by extension, obligations to their city. They uh, were to, commit, uh, to perform sacrifices for the gods, um, and uh, you know, do other, other things to uh, appease the gods, to worship the gods, and abandoning the city would mean abandoning their, their duties, and thus they would be impious. The other concept that's really important here is honor. Uh, Romans in the Republican period, in the, in the period of the Republic, uh, were very concerned with the concept of honor. To do something for Rome, uh, to, to uh, perform a public service, uh, brought a person honor. And I think for Camillus, he sees this opportunity for people to distinguish themselves, to gain honor by helping to rebuild the city. He himself has gained honor by winning this victory over the Gauls and by freeing Rome from that threat. And now he's saying, this is our chance to reclaim our honor as a people. If we were to flee, he says, we would do so as a conquered population, not as someone, as, as a you know, community acting in wise ways. Okay, so those are a few concepts about Livy that I think will be helpful to understand this. Now, of course, the questions that you need to ask yourself and that I, I you know, want to talk about in the discussion boards are, why do people become so tied to a place? We may not have augurs and concepts of gods like the ancient Romans did, uh, but, but maybe we in the modern day still feel this very uh, close tie to specific pieces of land, pieces of earth, as it were. And so uh, let's talk about that in the discussion board.